And as fascinating as it is to watch the division between art and life dissolve, it must have been exhausting and terrifying for him. What is this now? Two episodes back to back without a four month delay between them? Unheard of. What do I credit this uh, sudden industriousness in my YouTube output towards? Maybe my meds have finally kicked in. Maybe the coffee is just that good. Or maybe it's the fact that my obsessive compulsive personality has found a new fixation toward which I've directed way too much of my attentional bandwidth, shall we say. I'd like to think my loss of sleep benefits your reading. Don't mistake this for a purely altruistic venture, though. I live for the dopamine hits that come by way of likes, comments, shares. I'm a millennial. It's in my bloodstream. Where was I going with that? Oh, yes. Welcome to Waste Mailing List, Episode 8. Nine if you count the Schmidt intro, but let's be real, this numbering's fairly arbitrary, isn't it? As always, I'm your host, Seth. And today I'm bringing you the first volume of my deep dive series into the phenomenal German experimentalist Arno Otto Schmidt. Before we jump in, let me give you a lay of the land. This series is my attempt to combat the, shall we say, paucity of contemporary online discussion that surrounds this particular author, as well as a means to help uh, new readers navigate the extremely disorienting world of letters that comprises his fiction. If you're new to Schmidt, and not really sure what to make of him or where to start, I'd actually encourage you to go back and watch my primer episode, which was conceived to help contextualize his work for unfamiliar readers. This episode, however, is intended to act as a critical supplement to the first volume of his early fiction, and would best be served by people who are currently reading, have just read, or are thinking about reading the collected novellas. And while we're on the subject, Today's video actually poses a unique challenge to me relative to what I usually cover on this channel. When looking at the market for fiction on an international scale, the audience for literature specifically is a fraction of a fraction. With the attention economy being what it is, and let's uh, try not to turn this into a techno-social polemic if we can help it, I would argue that reading as a pastime has been more or less decimated in recent decades. Of those who continue to do so, and we love you for it, you need to then slice that readership down even further when you consider that this isn't just literary fiction. This is literary fiction of an experimental nature in translation that's out of print. At least for now. I addressed that in the last episode. Compound that even further by the fact that we're not even talking what people would often consider a major work here. These are novellas from the author's catalog of early fiction. The kind of thing that well-established Schmidt fans would be amenable to, but new readers might be less attracted toward. Not many people choose to start their Sylvia Plath reading with uh, Winter Trees as opposed to something like The Bell Jar or Ariel. Yeah? Same idea here. The novellas are a niche of a niche of a niche. By that token, what we have as an audience for this collection here is a contingent of readers that is vanishingly small. So I want to try and widen that concentric circle just a little bit, and I'm going to do so with a pitch. What if I told you that these novellas aren't minor works? These aren't scraps left over from dusty notebooks with half-baked ideas from an author who is still trying to find his voice. These novellas are fully formed, exquisitely crafted thought experiments that German literary scholars consider among the best fiction written in the post-war era. I struggle to think of another example of a collection of short works that was this well executed and this accomplished so early in an author's career. The closest comparison I would think would be Rainbow Stories by William T. Volman. I urge you to set aside any preconceived notions you have about short stories and novellas and give this first volume of Schmidt's work a go. And I'm here to try and help you make sense of it. As always, 
audio only and text transcripts of today's episodes are available in the show notes below, the usual places. You know what to do. I'm just going to plug the phone in because I realized it is not plugged in and I don't want it to die while we're trying to record. As I mentioned in the previous episode, 1994 was the year that Dalkey Archive Press undertook the no small task of reissuing, more or less, Schmidt's entire collected works into English. With the exception of Marion Boyer's and Green Integer, Dalkey Archive is the only publisher to have released Schmidt's work into English to this day. His works have since mostly fallen out of print, but a reissue from Dalkey is on the horizon. For more information on that, see the last episode. You're going to hear me say that a lot today. The Collected Novellas is the first volume of Dalkey Archive's early fiction series, and that comprises the majority of Schmidt's work from 1949 to 1964. As I understand it, there was quite a bit of internal debate on the Dalkey editorial team as to where to start with Schmidt's fiction. And John E. Woods actually addresses this in his fantastic introduction to the novellas. Which works? Where do we start? The editors have chosen the novellas. In Schmidt's hands, a most elastic genre, which he tugged and squeezed to suit his fancy. It was his genre of choice in the early years, and for that reason alone, the ten novellas will serve nicely as a door onto his word universe. For what it's worth, and I'm not a Schmidt completist, so grains of salt, I agree, this is the ideal place to start. Given that Schmidt's style and experimentation evolved organically over the years, I think the novellas provide an excellent both chronological and stylistic foundation from which to start. I don't know if that's saying much though, given that there's a case to be made for reading any author chronologically, particularly those with a large output. So what are we talking here? The collected novellas are an assemblage of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 10 early works of fiction that were written and published between 1946 and 1957. Broadly speaking, these works were the foundation upon which Schmidt earned his reputation as a l'enfant terrible, as well as a massively influential force in the development of German literature after the fall of Nazism. The 10 stories are titled as follows, each with a subtitle which I'll let you discover in your own time. Enthemesis, Leviathan, Gadir, Alexander, The Displaced, Lake Scenery with Pocahontas, Cosmos, Tina, Goth, and Republica Intelligentsia. I have to do a little find and replace action there because I didn't realize it was titled Republica. I never paid attention to that last A. Historically speaking, Enthemesis, Leviathan, and Gadir were all published in a short volume or triptych under the title Leviathan, which was actually Schmidt's first published collection of prose. The Displaced and Alexander were published as a duology under the title The Resettlers, and the rest of these stories were released independently. He wasn't an instant hit, mind you. He was mostly ignored until the early 50s with the release of Lake Scenery with Pocahontas, which got him nearly hauled into court for blasphemy and pornography. It was only then that critics, academics, and ambitious readers turned their attention back toward these early works and realized what a rare talent they had been sleeping on. While still early in his creative development, these were the works that made a lifelong writing career for Schmidt. It was also because of these stories that he became socially exiled, arguably of his own volition, to the margins of society for his incendiary and socially critical content. Now, the pieces range quite considerably in their length. At the short end, you have Leviathan and Gadir, which clock in at right around 20 pages, Whereas on the higher end, you've got Republica Intelligentsia, which is around 130 pages. Schmidt was a little bit slippery with the dividing line between short story and novella and novel. I'll be damned if the guy didn't have a range, though. He wrote pieces that span from just a couple of sparse pages, as is the case with the collected stories, all the way up to several thousand densely packed folio-sized pages, as is the case with Bottom's Dream, which rounds out to a gentleman's 1.3 million words. But it's not what we're here to talk about today. Much to some of your disappointment, I'm sure. <laughs> 
In terms of approaching this collection, these 10 novellas could theoretically be grouped into several combinations based on their shared stylistic and thematic content. As a rough heuristic, this would be my recommended way of approaching them. I'd group three of the first four stories under the identifier The Antiquity Trilogy, and that comprises Enthymesis, Gadir, and Alexander. That's your first thematic and chronological set. The next three, The Displaced, Leviathan, and Lake Sceniru with Pocahontas, I would tentatively refer to as the Zettelkasten Foundation. And I'll get to my explanation of that in the section titled Note Cards and Photographs. The two stories, Tina and Goth, pair nicely together, and that just leaves Cosmos and Republica Intelligentsia as outliers. It's worth noting that Republica Intelligentsia has been previously published by Marion Boyers under the title The Egghead Republic, and that was translated by M.B. Horowitz. It's still available in that format today. Now, if I were pressed for a straight answer, I don't think you need to read this collection in any particular grouping or order. You're welcome to pick and choose these stories and graze on them at your leisure. Schmidt said himself, specifically in reference to his big book, to read what interests you and skip over what doesn't. And he shares this perspective with uh, William T. Volman, who says the same thing about his own work. I've identified these groupings simply as a way to provide a little bit of structure to your reading and to ensure that you get the most out of them conceptually, stylistically, and thematically. As always, your mileage may vary. John E. Wood's reputation precedes him. He's considered one of the most important and formidable translators from German in the contemporary era, not least of all for his comprehensive work on Schmidt. I spoke briefly in the last episode about his personal history translating Schmidt, so if that's something you'd be interested in knowing a little more about, I'd encourage you to go back and give that a watch. He sadly passed away this year at the age of 80 at his home in Berlin and The New Yorker published a generous tribute to both his life and his career shortly thereafter. I've pinned a link to it below. I hope it goes without saying that I consider myself deeply indebted to translators, without whom I would have never gotten the chance to read many of the books that I consider now among my personal favorites. In these circumstances, I find it best to draw from the words of the professionals. This is a quote from Schmidt speaking with Catherine Tulin in an interview for Dalkey Archive on the subject of translating Schmidt. Translation is, as I am wont to say, an impossibility. Every language is unique to itself. So a translator tackles that impossibility anew with every author, with every sentence for that matter. Arno Schmidt is in one sense just another case of that impossibility. The density of his prose is sui generi, even in German, which can be intimidatingly dense. Then there's the wordplay the dance of literary references, the Rabelaisian humor, all packed into what I like to think of as fairy tales for adults. So what does a translator do? He puts on his fool's cap and plays and dances and hopes he amuses. Do not include footage of me putting on chapstick in the final video. I would not be pleased with you. I think Woods has imbued himself with a misplaced sense of modesty. As I would consider his work, not a fool's errand at all, but rather a example of virtuosic adaptation. If you're watching this video, it stands to reason that you're already familiar with Schmidt's uniquely esoteric approach to typography, syntax, grammar. You've got that on top of his pre-existing logophilia and uh, what I would call exuberant willingness to mine his dictionary for obscure and archaic relics from German language history. If you needed any further convincing, Woods cheerfully informs his readers in the introduction to the novella that Schmidt's three favorite books were Finnegan's Wake, the compact edition of the Oxford English Dictionary, and the Encyclopedia Britannica, 13th edition, of course. That is to say, Woods had his work cut out for him. Before I move on from the subject of translation, I want to briefly touch on a line I picked up from a reflective essay from Julian Royos in the Dalkey Archive Review of Contemporary Fiction, Arno Schmidt number. I hope you'll indulge the first of many digressions in this Schmidt series. Rios is a fascinating figure, and he's known for writing one of the most Wakeian novels in the contemporary era, Larva, A Midsummer's Night's Babble. Midsummer Night's Babble. 
This is another one of those psychedelic lexical experiments in the vein of Finnegan's Wake. It's effectively a reimagining of the Don Juan myth as told through a narrative that takes place at a masquerade ball being held at an abandoned London mansion. Like Schmidt, Rios is very playful with his execution of typography and syntax. If you open up Larva, you'll find the right-hand pages contain the narrative proper, and the left-hand pages are a mock scholarly commentary, deconstructing both the story as it unfolds, but also the language that's used to tell that story. The book itself is basically a charcuterie spread of puns, palindromes, and acrostics. I haven't read the entire book myself yet, so I don't want to comment too deeply on it, but I have read enough to tell you that this is absolutely worth chasing down a copy. From an ephemeral standpoint alone, how many books do you own that have a fold-out map of their narrative action woven their way into it? Utterly bizarre. Anyway, I think we've deviated from the point a little bit here. The essay that I'm referring to is titled Moments from the Work of a Fawn, Basic Schmidt for Foreigners, and that can be found in the Arno Schmidt number of the Review of Contemporary Fiction from 1988. If you're a seasoned Schmidt reader, you may recognize that title as a play on one of the stories from Noba Daddy's Children, Scenes from the Life of a Fawn. In this essay, Rios includes a particular statement which I find quite illuminating. Everything can be translatable, provided that the translator has enough freedom, initiative, and creative gifts to apply, in a balanced manner, what could be called the law of compensations. What is lost in one area of the original can be compensated for in another one of the translation. I think Rios is uniquely well positioned to weigh in on this, as Larva was originally written in Spanish, and he worked closely with Suzanne Gill Levine to translate the work into English. When we're talking about wordplay like homonymic puns and portmanteaus, two features that both Schmidt and Royos traffic heavily in, what functions orally in one language may not directly translate over to another. Take the title of one of Schmidt's late novels, and please forgive the pronunciation here, Kaf och Mechrisium. Directly, that translates to something like Podunk or The Sea of Tears. Kaf is an article of German slang that translates over to English to mean something roughly like a podunk or a remote hamlet or backwater town. It takes on a double meaning, as Kaf can also refer to chaff, which has some diegetic relevance to the story. So what we have here in German is a clear pun that pertains nicely to both stories that comprise this particular narrative. Now, podunk doesn't have any association with chaff in English, so that pun is lost. This is where Woods needed to editorialize a little bit and come up with an alternate title to account for that lost pun. And that's how he landed on Boondocks Moondocks, with Schmidt's trademark vertical superimposition of the B over top of the M. Aw, oh, dude, really? Strata people are in the hallway. Hopefully they only spend a couple of minutes here. You won't see many of these overlaid words prior to Boondocks Moondocks, but after that point he used them heavily in his later works, particularly Evening Edged in Gold. This is what Rios means when he refers to the law of compensation. Much of the grammatical or oral double meanings in German are null and void when adapted into English. So in order to maintain the linguistic exuberance and energetic wordplay of Schmidt's original work, Woods had to find parallel puns and portmanteaus and acrostics in English that follow Schmidt's internal logic. And it's incredible how well he managed to do this. And it's why if you're reading any of the author's work in English, you're not just reading Schmidt. You're reading Schmidt and Woods as an inexorable pair. It's both of their writing interwoven, every sentence and word chosen precisely. I'll say the same thing I said about George Surtees in my first video. We have just as much to thank Woods for translating this as we have Schmidt for writing it. John O'Brien would bristle at the mention of Dalkey Archive publishing difficult literature. He attributed that term to lazy academics and average readers who hadn't had their reading skills corrupted by the system. He didn't shy away from titles that threw down challenges. Complicated literature is not something to be afraid of. Flowing on from the Postian theory of 
Dalkey's creative ethos. I would argue that Schmidt's work should be approached not as difficult, but as disorienting. As I said before, the point of this series is to orient you as to what this author was up to. And you'll hear me say this again and again, the language is the story. Schmidt shared an ambition with his neo-romantic and high modernist forebears, and he was dead set on pushing the boundaries of the German language. Now, I'm the one editorializing here, but I say there was a clear political motivation behind this formal provocation. Schmidt lived through the height of Nazism in wartime Germany, and he witnessed firsthand how that era impacted, some might even say mutated, the day-to-day -day experience of reality. That sentence is a little too passive, so let me spell it out for you in more explicit terms. The era in which he wrote is directly implicated in the character of his writing. I spoke about this concept previously in my episode with Max Lawton on the subject of Sorokin and socialist realism. But to reiterate, fascist and totalitarian regimes regularly use language as a tool to manipulate and control their populations. German, as the language was previously understood, was stolen by the Nazis and altered to suit their ideological goals. Setting aside propaganda-infused catchphrases and vocabulary changes, as a regime, the Nazis subscribed heavily to the notion of language purity. Following the playbook of most totalitarian regimes, they endeavored to eliminate words and phrases that they deemed were foreign. And in this case, you can basically read that as Jewish. As I've mentioned previously, there was no love lost between Schmidt and the Nazi regime under which he was briefly drafted. While his provocative avant-gardism could potentially just be read as a matter of personal eccentricity, I don't think it's a reach to say it was also a form of political protest. While the Nazis were busy promoting a form of linguistic rigidity, Schmidt comes through with a nail-studded baseball bat and breaks down every one of those rules and conventions word by word. There's a gorgeous line that I've pulled from the story Lake Scenery with Pocahontas, which I think reads as a sort of a guiding ethos to the entirety of Schmidt's work in the novellas. Think. Don't be content with belief. Go further. Once more through the circles of knowledge friends and foes. Don't interpret, learn and describe. Don't futurize, be. And die without ambitions. At best, full of curiosity. Eternity is not ours. The German language and psyche were irreversibly altered by war. And so, with a creatively progressive spirit guiding his writing, Schmidt experimented with language in such a way so as to reflect the changes in post-war life. Moreover, he did so with a stylistic middle finger to the regime that tried to pin him down with a set of strictures that he viewed were just simply too restrictive to express himself. Someone could write an entire doctoral dissertation on the subject, so I'm really only going to skim the surface here. I want to move on to the next section of the discussion, but not before dropping in another one of the exceptional quotes from Johnny e. Woods. Arno Schmidt represents a revitalization of the German language that is very hard for any translation to reproduce. A voice speaking in a language I had found nowhere else in Germany. It had its roots in expressionism, and on occasion can partake of the movement's excesses. Schmidt sweeps up words off the street and calls them from tomes hidden in subterranean stacks. The result is vulgar and arcane, impish and regal. Gnarled syntax, usually the bugbear of German, is cast aside in favor of prose with a swift, knife-like thrust. Dehydrated was Schmidt's own term for it. It is difficult for speakers of English to comprehend what Schmidt did for German. One of the principal concerns of Schmidt's early work is the way in which totalitarianism and fascist ideology played a pivotal role in reshaping the progress of the 20th century. Moreover, as a voracious reader of history and the classics, Schmidt was acutely attuned to the manner in which that the era he was living through seemed to be repeating many of the mistakes of the past. This is at least one reason why antiquity and the ancient era made for such a fruitful setting for much of the stories that you'll see in his early work. 
I mentioned up top that three of these stories could theoretically be grouped together into sort of a conceptual trilogy that I refer to as the Antiquity Trilogy. Enthymesis, Alexander, and Gadir all take place within the ancient era of approximately 150 to 350 BCE and share a lot of the same thematic material. Irrespective of their chronology, proto-fascism and imperialist thinking are governing forces that you will see running through all three of these stories. This, of course, demands some sort of a reference framework. What exactly do we mean when I evoke the term fascism? Well, that depends who you ask, as that term has been quite heavily co-opted and diluted in recent social and political discourse. This being a literary show, let's keep our reference point literary, shall we? In 1995, Umberto Eco penned an essay for NYRB in which he identified 14 features of what he referred to as your fascism, or eternal fascism. Now, before your migraine sets in, you can relax. I'm not going to go through all 14 features one by one. I have, however, linked to a video below which does do so in detail. It's worth a watch. Now I will note that Echo was explicit that these 14 features are not intended to be used as a sort of checklist for identifying fascism, but are rather intended as a kind of collection of tendencies which he saw present in the majority of fascist political movements of the era. Echo wrote this piece in response to the rise of neo-fascist and far-right political movements which he saw at the time, particularly in Italy. He was concerned about the ways in which these contemporary movements were using symbols and slogans and tactics of historical fascism, and he wanted to demonstrate for his readers what he was viewing as a sort of historical recapitulation. Now, a couple of things worth noting right from the jump. Firstly, ancient Greece, where several of these novellas are set, far predates the emergence of what would conventionally be understood as modern fascism. Secondly, Schmidt died before Echo ever wrote that piece, so I can't claim that Schmidt was influenced by it in any direct way. And thirdly, and this is arguably the most important one, I don't want to be accused of historical backshadowing. That is to say that the entirety of German history is just a slow march that would inevitably lead to Nazism. That would be a distorted view of a very narrow scope in that country's history. However, this notion that fascism is not a fixed or monolithic ideology, but rather a collection of tendencies that can take different forms in different historical and cultural contexts, is a useful valence through which to view a lot of Schmidt's early work. Take Echo's second tenet, for example, the rejection of modernity. This second point from the essay, and I'm going to be semi-quoting here, aims to demonstrate that the Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason, is seen as the beginning of modern depravity. All throughout the novellas, you will find characters butting up against power structures that reject progressive thinking. The first story, Enthymesis, embodies this tenet nicely. This story is a diaristic account from a Greek bematist named Philostratus, who's contracted to calculate the distance between Cyrene and Alexandria as a means to then determine the circumference of the Earth. Trouble here is that Philostratus doesn't believe that the Earth is round, but flat. He remains willfully ignorant to the development of the scientific understanding of our world. Tensions develop within the expeditionary team, and he's eventually left to fend for himself, wandering deliriously, looking for some silver city in the middle of an African desert. I found a dissertation online by a PhD candidate named Ryan Kerr, who examined the notion of antiquity and totalitarianism in Schmidt's early work. I'm going to quote from his piece titled, Writing Its Own Ruins Forever, Man. To illustrate history from the perspective of the conquered, Arno Schmidt relies upon a disorienting strategy. Schmidt's novellas typically take place in one of the empires of ancient history. Unlike typical historical accounts, Enthymesis is told from the perspective of one of the empire's dissenting citizens. The leaders of the Roman Empire had to get rid of him because they could take no more of his public criticism, 
So clearly, it is Philostratus' open defiance of the dominant ideology that marks him as an outsider and exiles him to his fate. After Philostratus' diary ends, Eratosthenes, a member of Rome's ruling class, provides a brief ending to the story. The deaths of Philostratus and his party members, Eratosthenes notes, were not all that unwelcome in light of larger Greek interests. Eratosthenes' ominous conclusion, his statement that, in the place where Philostratus died, there was no trace at all of him or his books, is indicative of the unimportant figure of Philostratus and his subsequent erasure from the historical narrative. Eratosthenes symbolizes the class that determines who will be represented by history, since this class also determines the ruling ideology and eliminates anyone who disagrees with them. I don't think it was a coincidence that Enthymesis was the first story that Schmidt wrote after the Second World War. Much of what the Nazis enacted on German culture and language were acts of erasure. The Nazi regime had a strong influence on the German education system, particularly the education of language. And Kerr is correct. At the end of the story, Enthymesis, Philostratus dies alone in the desert, and the piece is concluded from the perspective of Eratosthenes, a member of Rome's ruling class at the time. How right I was in my judgment of Philostratus is amply demonstrated by this diary of his, which I found one month later on the occasion of a renewed general measurement of the earth in that same jumble of hills. He was a tall, powerful man of middle years, with blue eyes and wavy blonde hair. Indicative of the man's general character, he was undeniably of great brilliance and multiple talents, and yet remained a phantast and visionary, a type found sometimes among exceptional young men. The best proof of this is in his catalogue of his favorite books. His opinion of me is irrelevant. May posterity decide. The last feverish dreams of the dying man appear not to lack some basis in reality. As we were examining the shards of the amphora, strangely enough, there was no trace at all of him or his books. Two giant birds, passing at a great height, flew over us and away. This ending of the death of a dissenting narrator and the overtaking of the first-person perspective by a member of the uh, dominant class could potentially be mapped onto what Schmidt was witnessing under Nazism. The erasure of submissive perspectives under the growing metastasis of a totalitarian regime. Now I'm going off book a little bit here, but in reading that passage, I actually just picked up on something I didn't get the first time, and that was this description of Philostratus, the dissenting narrator who dies. He was a tall, powerful man of middle years with blue eyes and wavy blonde hair. Those last two phenotypic features do sound a lot like what was sought after as the Aryan ideal, which sort of adds an extra wrinkle to the story making me think, okay, who exactly did Schmidt position as the dominant and the submissive class here, or the elect and the preterite, if you want to put it in Pinchonian terms? I'd probably have to think on that for a little while. Come to me if you have an interpretation. The ending of Enthymesis also fits within Echo's fifth tenet, the fear of difference. Fascists often promote a narrow, homogenous view of society and reject diversity and pluralism. This concept can be applied nicely to the fourth story in this collection and the third and what I referred to earlier as the Antiquity Trilogy, Alexander. This story, again a travel diary, focuses on the experiences of Aristotle's student Lampon as he travels by boat down the Euphrates to meet up with Alexander the Great. And while he's on this boat, nearly every conversation this narrator shares with his companions is focused on Alexander and the absolutely massive territory that he has amassed for himself. Midway through the story, Lampon goes on an absolute tirade against his companions as he states the following. The highest ideal would of course be a harmonious world empire, a united and thus peaceful ecumen, an isophrene, a line of equal stupidity clever, binds all human beings without exception, and nations. 
The end goal of the Alexandrian Empire was always to homogenize diverse groups of people under the strictures of a universal law. What is that, if not exactly what the Nazis aimed to achieve in their co-opting of the German language and their erasure of people who they felt were inferior? Progressive notions introduced into antiquated societies is a very consistent through line that you will see trace its way through the entirety of the novellas. You'll see it particularly strongly in Schmidt's seventh story in this collection, Cosmos or A Mountain to the North. Set in a Roman province, this story follows a young man who upholds the ancient Greek ideals of education and critical thinking. However, his worldview is challenged when he encounters a Christian doctrine known as the Mountain to the North, which attempts to reconcile the ancient belief in a flat earth with this newer notion of a spherical earth. This uh, novel model for the shape of the terrestrial world is uncoincidentally a tabernacle, this being a Christian belief system and all, which Schmidt actually includes a diagram of on the first page. This encounter forces the young man to grapple with the conflict between reason and faith and ultimately leads him to question his own beliefs and values. Interrogating one's own beliefs is a facet of critical thinking that is vastly underutilized these days, particularly in political discourse. But let's park that before this turns into a tirade that no one wants to listen to. Where was I? Right, fascism. Echo's third tenant, the cult of tradition has a particularly strong utility in the third story in this collection, titled Gadir. Fascists tend to have a, a fetishistic view of the past, idealizing a time in which their people were strong and pure. This view of the distant or mythical past is contingent on the notion that the past is gone and it can't be reclaimed. But it possibly can be rebuilt based on the fictive preoccupations in these various stories, it doesn't seem like a stretch to me that Schmidt was ruminating on a similar set of ideas. Gadir is another diaristic story. Given Schmidt's social solitude, it's somewhat unsurprising to me that he favored this format in a lot of his shorter works. Though, it bears repeating that this isn't the only mode that he writes in. Anyhow, this story is the possibly anachronistic diary of a man named Pythias, who was a Greek scientist who was imprisoned for 52 years in a Carthaginian cell, uh, Carthage being the modern day Cadiz. And the story is structured around his numbering of each day that he spends in this cell. Here's a passage from year 52, day 120. Morning passes, forenoon, restless. Understandable if you leave your four walls once every thousand days, right? Around noon, a hornet, a flame of garish yellow and brown, stormed through the window bars, swooped about wild and brainless. Long as my little finger, the monster, soon beat it to death, chased it, cold and sneaky as a fate. I hate insects with a primal hate. As a child, when I was walking through a grove in June, I would sometimes shake with rage. I'd stop from the forbearing treetops. I'd hear the whispered gorging of chiliads and maggot jaws, creeping, boring, sawing, sucking. Wasps thrust pliant blades into arched caterpillar bodies and worm munched worm. As boys, we once pulled a black fish out of the deep wreaths off the harbor of Lacedon. It was nothing but a floating maw fixed with teeth. Since then I've known the good is unnatural, undivine, probably inhuman too. A Ligurian mercenary once told me up in the north there were tribes who made cuts down both sides of a captured enemy's back, right through the ribcage, and with the fellow still alive pulled out the lobes of its lungs. They called it carving the bloody eagle. And don't think it's like that only up north. Men and gods can shake hands. They deserve each other. What a cranky old fuck. <laughs> Granted, I probably would be too if I was in prison for 52 odd years in solitary, so. The narration which covers roughly the time span of about a week is this sort of free associative blend of 
memories, thoughts, dreams, and plans for escape. The whole thing ends with a false imagining of Pythias' escape as he descends into delirium and then death shortly thereafter. Ryan Kerr reflected brilliantly on this story in his dissertation, which I'll quote from here again. In keeping with his other fictional representation of ancient Greek and Roman imperialism, Schmidt's novella Gadir chronicles the thoughts and feelings of Greek scientist Pythias while he's held captive in Fort Shabar prison in Carthage. When considering the grammarians of his era and their thoughts on verb tense, Pythias reflects on the difference between the intense but very narrowly limited present I am and the past, which is rich with memories, full of images, secure, and thus multi-leveled. Despite popular conceptions of a completed past that no longer reaches into the present, the perfect past, if you will, Pythias sees the notion as markedly different from the recent past, which is still having its full effect on the present. The recent past and the present, as Schmidt shows, are inexorably bound up to the ancient history that came before it. Goddamn, I wish I was that smart. This is where I see Schmidt and Echo in conversation with one another. Echo wrote his 14 tenets in response to a series of troubling political movements which he saw emerging in his country, while Schmidt was quite literally drafted into the movement of his. These two used the only weapons that they had, their writing, to combat this regressive backstep into the errors of history. What better place than the theater of the past to let these ideas loose? As well as being a formative 20th century author, Schmidt was also a well-regarded self-taught photographer. I've pinned a short article below which features an archive of some of the photographs that he shot between the 30s through till the end of his life. He had a very unique eye behind the lens, one which lacked a certain uh, refinement and polish and didn't have that self-important grandiosity that you would find in the natural photographs of someone like Ansel Adams. There's a lack of pretension, which I personally find quite attractive. There's a particular photo in his archive of publicly available shots, just titled Photo 77, which was of notable interest to me for its use of texture and composition, as well as its associations. And I'm gonna to return to that photo in a little bit here. In 49, Alfred Doblin, one of Schmidt's foremost intellectual influences, awarded him the Maine's Grand Academy Prize for Literature for his short story, Leviathan. He used the prize money to purchase a Bonifix film roll camera. Schmidt always held his camera to be, and these are his words, an indispensable tool for the entirety of the literary production of his life. There's a line in Evening Edged in Gold where he refers to the camera's ability to be able to catch a whole bunch of memories. It's a bit clunky in the delivery of that sentiment, but the point still stands. Now, Schmidt's photography wasn't just a side hobby, but rather was intimately interlinked with the character and the style of his writing. His photos served as visual notes, they established settings, and oftentimes they provided sensory details on which to anchor certain passages in his writing. Here's a passage from Estella Kumstedt's article, and I'm going to need to check the title on this one. Arno and Alice Schmidt, Photos from Three Centuries, which tessellates this idea outward quite nicely. The photography, as well as the thoughts about their specific possibilities, are conspicuously present in Arno Schmidt's literary work. In Bottom's Dream, the camera is a protest against transitoriness. It's in a position to keep things from being forgotten. Schmidt knew that images are not made in the camera, but rather in the head. What's more, image and text in Arno Schmidt's work flow into one another insofar as, on the one hand, the viewing of photographs immediately conjures up memories in the form of words. The image says not more than the famous thousand words. It allows many more words to come into being, in that it calls up associations and memories. On the one hand, Schmidt's linguistic work compresses itself in turn to exceedingly colorful images and often linguistic photograms with a positive negative effect as well as into audio images, given the strong phonographic element of his prose. 
Okay, so this is a lovely postmortem on Schmidt the photographer, but what does it have to do with the novellas? The fifth and sixth stories, the displaced and lake scenery with Pocahontas, threw me through a bit of a loop with their typesetting. Both these stories start with a block of text enclosed in a square aligned to the right of the page. The same format repeats following each paragraph break, which denotes a change of scene. It's really quite odd to encounter the first time. The only reference point that I had for something like this was Daniel Lusky's House of Leaves, which wouldn't be entirely off base given Schmidt's penchant for ergodic typesetting. But in saying that, I think Schmidt had a more concretized idea as to what he was trying to do structurally and thematically with this orientation on the page. Jeez, I haven't looked at House of Leaves in ages. Hmm. I wish I had read this when I was younger. Like, I, I did really enjoy it, but like, I think I would have been absolutely fucking obsessed with this book if I had read it when I was like 17. Here, let me read you one. This is from the story, The Displaced, very beginning of it, which focuses predominantly on a narrator who is hitching a train in order to escape political persecution. But then here came the Trempanau delivery van, and they had to follow, dragged with m It's, fuck, it's difficult to read Schmidt's prose out loud because it's got this sort of weird dissonant rhythm to it that I find quite challenging to be able to actually vocalize. Let's try again. The precocious moon slipped, rickety skewed over the railroad embankment. Just once flesh sated. Bushes still adorned with some fresh rain and able to take up smoking again. A fat cloud floozy stretched gray shoulders behind the evening woods. Macaroni and the hard wedge of Swiss grated in. Two whirly winds ran up to me with gentle dusty manes, transparent yellow bodies, strayed closer abashed, quivering gathered their veils, turning and side ravishing. But then here came the Trempanau delivery van, and they had to follow dragged with long, monatically wrenched back. The guy with the car always has a better chance. All right, so what the hell is going on here? Schmidt viewed photography and mental imagery as explicitly interlinked, particularly when it comes to memory. Each one of these preceding text boxes serves as an initial snapshot from which the larger story grows. And this is because memory is accessed with the initial recall of an optically encoded highlight. Schmidt explained the technique in one of his extra textual essays titled Calculations 1. The starting point for the calculation of the first of these new prose forms was the reflection on the process of remembering. One remembers any small complex of experiences, be it elementary school, old summer trip, etc. Individual, very bright ones always appear first as time-lapse pictures, my abbreviation, photos, around which additional explanatory small fragments, or texts, are placed in the further course of the memory. Such a mixture of photo-text units is ultimately the end result of every conscious attempt at memory. This justifies the use of these highlights at the beginning of every new scene. While not the case in every one of his stories, much of the diegetic movement in the novellas is drawn from his own personal experiences and circumstances. Take trains, for example, which you'll find in The Displaced and Leviathan, among other places in the novellas. Trains provide a common setting in Schmidt's early work because this was the form of escape that he and his wife used when fleeing the Red Army in 45. Didn't entirely work out for him because he did end up in a British POW camp, but it's a story for another day. Point is, when drawing from his memories to establish a setting, he would use these photograph-like blocks of imagery-heavy text to kind of set the scene for what was about to unfold. Farts, look at the fucking hell. Good God, grousing soul. <sighs> See how we go here. Here's the last highlight from The Displaced. The red car, with its smooth panes, its bright handles, Long quilted cushions, the baggage trunk swelling up, called a Mercedes. 
how the lacquer light rolleth above wheeled vaults. It sways toward us, snarling, swifter than the normal wind, and presses the earth with its strong tires. Its voice is like the cry of a cassowary. Across its thick ribbed chest the bumper bolt zags, the red car. Thou spitting tin mandrel, leer not so randily out of the cuttle button eyes at Katrin through her skirt. Covet me not so supplely in thy bubbly soft with rut. Yowling, sham animal, thou slayest the evening, thy bluish toxic farts slinkish down all ways. Numbers on thy glowing monkey smooth butt art thy name, a dreary salesman thy grousing soul. The Red Car. I'll be the first to admit that Arno's imagery gets a little bit cluttered and frenetic at times, but he will always give you one clear sensory impression on which to anchor your mental construction of the scene. In this case, it's quite obvious. The red car. You'll find he's quite flexible with the frequency of these highlights as well. I noticed he deploys them more frequently in the story The Displaced rather than lake scenery with Pocahontas. And that's because that story takes place on a train. The scenery is constantly changing as distance is covered, and so he needs to establish a new t uh, set piece with regularity as the story unfolds. Actually, let's stay on that other story for a few minutes and divert from the photo highlight idea. We'll come back to it. Lake scenery with Pocahontas was particularly inflammatory in a number of ways. You may recall that this was the story that nearly got him criminally charged for blasphemy and pornography. Narratively, it follows an impoverished writer named Joachim taking a train ride out of the Saarland region of Germany. Not for nothing is the Saar region historically one of the most religiously prescriptive areas in the country. It is the sort of place where the liberally sexual activities of the narrator's experience would not be openly tolerated. Anyways, along the way after meeting a friend, Joachim encounters a pair of women who work in a textile factory. Despite the complete absence of any sexual chemistry between them, Joaquim and one of the women, Selma, end up descending into a sweaty romance over the course of a weekend that ends with a thud after Selma leaves the narrator for her fiancé. Bummer. The critic and scholar Klaus Theolite proposed that Pocahontas was an intentionally hedonistic attempt to combat the Nazis' repressive influence on freely lived sexuality. Think the um, uh, hippie free love movement in the American countercultural 60s. Under conditions of fascism and war, the human body becomes, above all else, the site of violence and destruction. Schmidt positions a war-scarred character in Joachim, at the center of a sexual exploration with an unfamiliar woman. And these are Thulite's words now. Depicting his war experienced Joachim in Pocahontas Embrace, his text undertakes a constant attempt to transform Nazi violence into a politics of physical contact, which preserves and enlivens the bodies by making them smile at themselves, instead of ceaselessly killing and mortifying. It's very much running parallel to the Roger Mexico, Jessica Swan Lake romance in Gravity's Rainbow. They are in love, fuck the war, that whole deal. I like that reading. There's a um, sensitivity and a sort of personal vulnerability to it. I think it's also worth knowing that others have posited that this was Schmidt's way of coping with a personally traumatic experience. In early 1945, before his capture by the British, Schmidt was involved for the first time in open combat in Oldenburg. Prior to this, he had spent the majority of the war in a clerk's office. The character of Pocahontas was allegedly modeled after a woman named Hannah Wolf, who Schmidt was infatuated with but never got up the courage to pursue directly. Some have proposed that Lake Scenery with Pocahontas is a story that serves as a coping mechanism for Schmidt's paralleling existential experiences, both the threat of a violent imposing death and unreclited love. This again loops back into the ways that Schmidt's personal memories fed directly into his writing. Memories which were, particularly in the later years of his life, recorded into photographs. Now there's a few ways you could slice up this photo imagery technique in the context of Schmidt's larger body of work but I have a personal interpretation. 
that has a lot to do with what's going on in this photo. To those of you listening rather than watching, this is an image of Schmidt sitting at his desk in his home office in front of a series of shallow wooden boxes filled with scraps of paper. The object itself, this wooden box, is referred to as a Zettelkasten, in which photographs or note cards are organized. Schmidt was famous for having favored the Zettelkasten as a way of organizing his thoughts. Now, if you have a keen ear or speak German, you've probably picked up on the term Zettel nested in there, which is, of course, where his magnum opus, Zettel's Traum, or Autumn's Dream as it was translated, derives its name. Here's Johnny Woods again on the subject of deciding on that title. As for Zettel's Traum, there was really only one possible title. In the classic Schlegeltik translation of Shakespeare, Bottom the Weaver in A Midsummer's Night's Dream was given the name Zettel, which is the warp of a fabric. And it's, of course, Bottom's Dream, which is the central metaphor of the novel. Lost again is a pun, for a Zettel is also a small slip of paper, especially one used to jot something down on. Schmidt used thousands of such slips on note paper to construct his later novels by arranging them in large homemade file boxes. This is how the author built out his thoughts into a larger story. Every time he had a notable idea, whether it be a point of narrative action or just a dirty pun, he would jot it down on a note card and drop it in the Zettelkasten for reference later. And he stored his photographs in the same way. God only knows what sort of organizational system he used to keep all that straight. The best estimates suggest that Bottom's Dream was accumulated from 140,000 of these notes. I know there's only a small contingent of readers, cum obsessives, who will find this sort of thing fascinating, but I'm going to drop it in here anyhow. The Arno Schmidt Writing Foundation has actually digitized a number of these zettles and made them publicly available online. If you go on their website, click on the drop-down menu that says Zettel Archive and you'll be able to view them. I'll link to it below. It truly is something else to see these scraps of handwritten documents that eventually coagulated together into his monstrous brainchild that was Bottom's Dream. If I'm ever brave enough to tackle the dream on this channel, you can bet your ass I'll be mining that archive for reference. But, back to the point. Earlier, I referred to this trio of stories, Leviathan, the Displaced, and Pocahontas, as the Zettelkasten Foundation. The reason I gave them this little moniker is because I see him formulating the technique that would eventually lead to the formation of his masterworks, namely Bottom's Dream, which is composed on a veritable pyramid of zettles. Between his pointillated prose, which I discussed in the previous episode, and these optically encoded highlights, what I see here is Schmidt figuring out an epistemological framework through which to approach his world of fiction. He believed in wrestling with reality on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, which justifies the fragmented nature of his prose. Each one of these photos and note cards is an individual moment in time, frozen in place, from which a story can grow organically. Whether it's a photo or a slip of paper is kind of beside the point. Both were his way of protesting against transitoriness, to borrow his words. These three stories serve as the earliest instances I can see of Schmidt figuring out how to turn this belief into a structure of writing. And that's why I refer to them as the foundation of his Zettelkasten technique. One more note on the subject, which is one of pure conjecture. At the risk of getting a copyright takedown notice on this video, I'm going to show that photo I mentioned earlier from his archive, Photo 77, and I've linked to uh, the original below. Again, if you're listening rather than watching, this is a square frame shot of a riverbed swollen with water and the reeds and grass are being pulled along down toward the right hand side of the frame. It's one of my favorite photo of Schmidt's, not least of all because I immediately associated it with one of the opening shots from Lars von Trier's film Melancholia. The opening scene of Melancholia comprises 16 shots which cover the entire narrative action of the film. And this is set to the opening prelude of Richard Wagner's opera Tristan und Isolde. If you haven't seen the film, I've linked to the scene in the corner here. <laughs> 
Each one of these images are presented in a hyper slow-mo sort of fresco style of shot to the effect where each of them looks like a photograph or a painting. The result of these significant sensory forward signifiers of where the story is currently headed. Von Trier is exactly the kind of weird fringe artist who I see as conceivably having read Schmidt. These 16 images read to me as exactly the same way in which Schmidt used these optically encoded highlights in his own writing. So it wouldn't be surprising to me in the slightest if it had turned out that Von Trier had been reading Schmidt while writing and composing this movie. I also think it's telling that the third shot in Von Trier's film is a depiction of Bruegel's landmark painting, Hunters in the Snow. Bruegel is an artist, along with Bosch, who deeply inspired Schmidt, particularly in his writing of Evening Edged in Gold. To add to the list of coincidences, Von Trier's entire opening scene is set to Tristan und Isolde. Let's trace that chain of influence backwards here. Wagner was heavily influenced by the work of Arthur Schopenhauer, who believed that humans are compelled by unattainable desires, and the vast disparity between our desires and their attainability is what produces suffering. Much of Schmidt's later work, particularly the typo scripts he wrote after he discovered Freud, are focused heavily on repressed, often unattainable sexual urges that drive our behavior. Melancholia as a film is focused heavily on the lead Justine's desire and the ever-widening gaps that are presented between her and I suppose the reality that she wants to live. I'm going to leave it there for now because I could really go on all day about Lars von Trier. I'm going to end this section with a quote from Schmidt's Foundation. In his early prose, he developed a narrative technique that was intended to do justice to this circumstance. His novels are composed of a chain of significant snapshots. As is the case anytime I try to talk about literature for a prolonged period of time, this episode has turned into a little bit of a hand grenade. I've basically thrown out a shitload of ideas into the ether, more or less connected, and I leave it to you to decide if you want to accept what's on offer. Schmidt is just one of those writers where he doesn't just put a single idea in my head, but every time he implants one, it grows three more out of it in Hydra-like fashion. I'm conscious of the fact that this could easily become a three-hour episode, so I'm going to try and round it out with one more key idea here that's governing a lot of what's going on in the novellas. And that's Schmidt's relationship to both legacy and melancholy, and the interplay between these two characteristics. The eighth story in this collection is titled Tina, or Concerning Immortality. In this story, the narrator, who serves as a stand-in for Schmidt, is invited by two deceased writers, Christian and Tina, to spend 36 hours in Elysium or Purgatory. And while he's there, he bears witness to the torment of writers condemned to the afterlife for as long as their names are spoken or printed. The following story, Goth and one of his admirers, inverts this by offering deceased writers the opportunity to briefly venture back into the world of the living. There's a line of dialogue that's delivered partway through the story in which a writer who's confined to Schmidt's contrivance of purgatory here says to the narrator, some advice, write less, or better yet, don't write at all. Then you shall live unblessed on earth, nor need to dredge further after death. And this is because the pseudo-Schmidt narrator is warned that everyone is damned to live here below for as long as his name still appears acoustically or optically on the earth above. Or, to put it more plainly, until he is neither mentioned nor exists anywhere in print or writing, at which point every possibility for a reconstruction vanishes. This line is an interesting little window into Schmidt's mind and why he's not quite the one-trick pony that some people have made him out to be. Schmidt is generally regarded, not wrongly so, as a hermit who monastically devoted himself to reading and writing rather than uh, forging relationships with people around him. I can't exactly blame the guy for retreating from society after what he went through in the war and the extreme poverty that he was subjected to after being released from the POW camp. In that essay I mentioned earlier, Julian Rios, 
described both Schmidt and his work, two things which are pretty much inseparable in the following way. In any case, it is true that the Schmidtian bibliography is a savage jungle in which our cultured faun hid himself. One can say that his life, like that of Borges, passed in a library. There's no denying that his reality was the world of fiction. But stories like Tina and Goth offer, at least to me, a little insight into what I suspect was Schmidt's difficult relationship with the choice to live this way. I tend to give Wallace a hard time on this show, but I do admire him for a number of reasons, not least of all his perspectives on loneliness. In 2003, he sat for an interview on the German TV station ZDF, in which he talked about the inherent loneliness that comes with reading. Reading, reading requires sitting alone by yourself in a quiet room and I have friends, intelligent friends, who don't like to read because they get, it's not just bored, there's an, uh, there's an almost dread that comes up, I think. I suspect that Schmidt did have his own questions and reservations about what uh, committing himself fully to his craft would mean for his legacy, almost in a spiritual sense. There's a, a certain Gnostic streak that I see underpinning all of the words. Dear God, so many fucking words. <laughs> was pouring his material life into his work, the immortality project that many writers aspire to? Or was it actually some sort of Faustian farcical trick? And there's actually eons of writers and scribes living below us waiting for their works to go out of print. I'm repeating myself a little bit here, but much of Schmidt's work is focused and fixated on the push and pull between unconscious desires and autonomous actions. And this interplay reaches its formative peak in Zettel's Traum, where he allowed this concept to bleed into the very formation of his language. That is the Edom theory I spoke about in the previous episode. I don't think he ever reconciled this for himself, so he did the only thing that he knew how to do keep pushing forward with his craft. To quote one of his posthumous stories, Julia or the paintings, the world of art and fantasy is the true one. The rest is a nightmare. Conceptually speaking, what exactly does it mean to immerse oneself in their vocation as wholly as Schmidt did? I could think of a word. Enthemesis. I think I'm clever. It's defined as a state of strong focused desire and intention and the projection of mental imagery that produces actual effects in objective reality. In Schmidt's worldview, the truest version of reality is the one that is forged in the theater of the mind. The circumstances of Schmidt's life were staged almost exclusively during periods of war, either active war or post-war or cold war. Now, I can't speak from direct experience, but I don't think it's a stretch to say that living like that constantly for the overwhelming majority of one's life would take its toll on their mind, regardless of the strength of their resolve. In the case of Schmidt, rather than surrender himself to the cruelty of the war machine, he took his pen to the world he saw around him and reimagined his reality into one of Rabelaisian irreverence. Nowhere in the novellas is that more apparent than in the final story, Republica Intelligentsia, or as it's sometimes referred to, the Egghead Republic. Brevity is going to be tough with this one because there is some capital P plot going on in this story, but I'm going to do my best to describe it as briefly as possible. The frame narrative is a sort of Borgesian meta-text that presents this story in the form of translated notes from an American journalist, Charles Henry Viner. He's been sent out by his press to write a story about the isolated conclave called the Republica Intelligentsia, which is situated off the coast of the post-apocalyptic USA set in 2008. Woo! <laughs> Oh, God, I love mid-20th century sci-fi. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, due to the radioactive fallout from a nuclear war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, the country is basically an uninhabitable and populated by mutant life forms, notably centaurs. 
Viner's end destination is the Republica Intelligentsia, or Egghead Republic, depending on which translation you read, which is a massive vessel jointly controlled by the US and Soviet Union, serving as a safe haven for scientists and artists. Now, despite its reputation as a sort of brain trust for all the brightest and most creative people left in the world, what Viner finds is uh, this dysfunctional cesspool of intrigue and double crossing and secret plots between community members, uh, all instead of the utopian enclave he was promised. Uh, the Republic is split down the middle with one side run by the US and the other by the Soviet Union, resulting in a very tongue-in-cheek Cold War narrative. Ultimately, a deal to broker a sort of peace between both sides falls through, and the Americans attempt to reverse the direction of the ship while the Soviets power ahead. Uh, as Viner's leaving the Republic via helicopter, the last thing he sees is just the vessel spinning around continuously in the ocean. <laughs> this final image of the Egghead Republic, this last bastion and enclave of the world's greatest minds and artists as a failed utopia just spinning around continuously in the ocean really stuck with me. It was the sort of immediate guttural impression that I didn't quite have the words to articulate when I first read it. Axel Gelfert's essay interpreted this incisively. In his paper, We Are the End of the World, Stories of the Anthropocenic Hyperarousal, it's a mouthful, uh, he states, when viewed from this angle, the final image of the Egghead Republic going round and round in circles without a sense of direction and at risk of being torn apart by centrifugal forces could just as well double as a metaphor for the futility of the arts and sciences once they have been fully subordinated to the powers that be and continue to exist only at their discretion. This plays into the notion of the divided impulse in Schmidt's mind that I suggested earlier. On the one hand, I know he would have treasured the possibility that the arts would be preserved under conditions of apocalypse, whether it be in a floating city in the middle of the ocean or anything else. On the other hand, Schmidt, being the absolutely ravenous reader that he was, had consumed enough of the detritus of our history to know that we are notorious for repeating the fuck-ups of the past. He witnessed firsthand the explosion of creative evolution under Weimar culture leading into the 30s. Then Nazism came along and expelled all these uh, artists and cultural intelligentsia from the country, or they co-opted them into their regime. So in theory, we could view the Egghead Republic as a sort of tight little illusion for what he had witnessed only a few decades earlier. But his work wasn't just retrospective, it was also prophetic. Because in the same way that he riffed on the errors of the past, he also prefigured what would happen in the future. In Republica Intelligentsia, the narrator witnesses an assortment of different artists on the Egghead Republic ship having their strings pulled by political actors on both the US and the Soviet side of the vessel. Look me in the face and tell me that isn't exactly what happened with these two countries in the Cold War leading into the 80s. Artists were propped up for decades as cultural ambassadors for both the US and the Soviet Union. Don't believe me? Look up the Congress of Cultural Freedom from the 1950s and you'll get a play-by-play -play on exactly how to fuck up a PSYOPs campaign. We as a species are pathetically predictable. So what better way to lay our reliability bare than to present it to us in a darkly comedic and deeply predictable envisioning of a possible world of tomorrow. Look, I'm not deluded enough to think that Schmidt's little story here actually had a direct influence on the Cold War. That would be one hell of a reach. But I don't think it's wrong to suggest that the circularity of history, combined with the influence of art on collective thought, is enough to render Schmidt's brand of enthymesis accurate. To repeat, a state of strong, focused desire and intention, and the projection of mental imagery that produces actual effects in objective reality. Whether Schmidt intended it or not, the conceptual foundations of these ten stories have crept into our reality, full stop. And as 
fascinating as it is to watch the division between art and life dissolve, conceptually speaking, it must have been exhausting and terrifying for him. But that creative impulse drove him every step of the way and he did not stop writing until the end of his life. And if he believes the future that his story Tina depicted, it's going to be one hell of a long time before his name goes out of print and he's finally laid to rest. I don't know if that thought would have delighted him or horrified him. I would have loved to ask. Schmidt was a complicated man with a complicated relationship to both literature and the world around him. But one thing I can say definitively about my introduction to his work is that what he's committed to paper here was clearly a focused beam of intention and desire. For that reason alone, Enthemesis is a damn fine name for his first published story. As always is the case when talking about German literature, I am nowhere near as eloquent as John E. Woods. And so I'd like to finish today's discussion with a passage from Woods' introduction to the novellas. If this episode hasn't provided you enough motivation to seek this out and read it for yourself, I hope this quote will. Reflecting on the literary process, in a series of three essays entitled Calculations, Schmidt spoke of his own work, and indeed most fiction, as an extended mind game. In the drab confines of a working-class Hamburg apartment, a lonely child dreams his way to other worlds. The inventive mind that chose the interior emigration of tedious office work now flees still further into itself to escape a crude barracks life in Norway, and finds its apotheosis in self-imposed exile in the village of Bargfeld. Schmidt dreamed and wrote of a life lived unto itself inside the mind, human existence as an island, both as rescuing fantasy and ineluctable doom. God damn, John, you had a way with words. Made it to the end. And so that's it. That's volume one of Schmidt's work, Collected Novellas. I said up top that it would be extremely difficult to be able to talk about these stories in any totalizing way, as I could have realistically spent an entire episode on any one of these ten pieces. This episode was really just a skim over the surface of this collection, which I hope you'll take the time out to read yourself. If you don't want to read this thing all the way through cover to cover, that's perfectly fine, but I'd still encourage you to pick at at least a few of the stories in here, as this is some of the strongest short fiction I've ever read. For what it's worth, my personal favorites from the novellas are uh, Enthemesis, Tina, Lake City with Scenery with Pocahontas, Probably The Displaced and Republica Intelligentsia, which is really like, I, I, I liked every story in here in some capacity. Uh, the last one in particular, The Egghead Republic, could have done with an entire episodic treatment on its own. It's quite a 